just to get you into this uh, subject, I just want to start with a question for you to think about. If you are someone who is not visually impaired, what thing, what's the first thing you say when you meet an old friend or someone you haven't seen for a long time? I would suspect that many of us, it will be something such as, wow, you look great, I haven't seen you for ages. Or um, I love that coat you're wearing. Or what a great hairstyle, that's changed. If you are visually impaired, I'd be really interested to hear what you might say. Then just think about what you say when you greet a child that you meet for the first time. A child you, you want to connect with, perhaps it's uh, after um, uh, a worship service, perhaps it's at school, perhaps it's meeting a new family. I wonder what's the first thing you say to connect with that child. Again, if we're really honest, I suspect for some of us, it would be something along the lines of, um, wow, those are fantastic trainers. Or I love that t-shirt. Or, you know, that sparkly hair clip looks great on you. Interestingly, there is some evidence that um, with boys, we tend to talk more about attributes and with girls, we tend to talk more about appearance. And that's often what children will provoke in us. So, you know, a three year old um, girl might actually want you to comment on her dress and, and, and sort of indicate that. Whereas a three year old boy might run very fast and say, look how fast I can run. Now, before everyone gets defensive and gives me lots of other examples, I don't want to generalize, but I do want us to really think about what we tend to say uh, to girls and to boys, how we connect with one another. I've certainly been noting myself in recent months and years and observing what other people say and do. And it is quite interesting. Another quick provocative comment. Um, in the Gospels, we don't have a single description of what Jesus Christ looked like when he walked on earth. Now, if we were writing a narrative of Jesus Christ uh, now, if Christ was here with us on earth now, I'm quite sure we would describe physical appearance. Um, just think of novels that you've uh, read or indeed written. And I expect there's quite a lot of narrative description of the different characters, what they look like, as well as their attributes. And of course, you'd be right to point out to me that we live in a very different culture, a different society, and how we do narrative. But that's not the whole answer. If we go right back to the Old Testament, if we go to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, if you know that passage, you will know that it's the time when uh, there's a new king needed to replace Saul and Samuel is sent to the household of Jesse to anoint a new king. And Samuel looks on Jesse's son uh, Eliab and says, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his statue, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So even hundreds of years before Christ came to earth, people judged other people by their appearance. It was an issue. And we get the uh, narrative where seven sons of Jesse passed before Samuel and all of them are rejected. And I always think this is a bit um, where the Old Testament is a bit like uh, the story of Cinderella because we get um, Samuel who says, you know, surely, surely there's someone else, surely there's another son. And uh, in fact, then we have David who's looking after the sheep the shepherd boy who comes forward. Of course, I would love to tell you at this point um, that scripture tells us that David was nothing to look at really. Actually, 
we're told that David was ruddy, had beautiful eyes and was handsome. But the important thing is that it seems that whilst uh, appearance was an issue for people choosing their new king, what is clear that God looked not on the outward appearance, but on the heart. Incidentally, um, I really like using that passage in primary school. It's also one of the passages um, in the messy church uh, module, if you like, that uh, we developed through the Lidentity campaign. It's a great story to use with children to talk about this issue. What it shows is that part of our human brokenness is that we always start on the outside. It's how we make judgments of one another. And it's not just about people either. It's about places, it's about creation. Think how many expressions there are in our language which recognize that. Don't judge a book by its cover. Appearances can be deceptive. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And of course, appearance is important in how we judge things. Um, we need to make quick decisions through looking at things. But it also reflects our sin and brokenness, if it's the only lens, if you like, that we look through. If that's the only way we draw conclusions, then that's all about our brokenness. But I could go off at a tangent here. So let's fast forward to the Lidentity campaign. So as Bishop Peter said, this was launched in 2016. Um, a big, um, I suppose, prod came from the Children's Society Good Childhood Report in that year. You may be very familiar with those reports which come up annually. And in 2016, the Good Childhood Report highlighted that one in seven girls aged between 10 to 15 were unhappy with their life and that more than one third of girls said that their unhappiness was due to their appearance. That's really shocking. And this was identified as an underlying cause of low self-esteem and poor mental health. And for me, one of the comments that sticks in my mind um, was a girl who said, we have to be perfect like Barbie. These are girls aged 10 to 15. And then also in that year, um, the Girl Guiding report came out, uh, the Girls Attitude Survey. And that found that girls as young as seven were saying they felt embarrassed about their bodies, that they were ashamed of how they looked. And a fear of their bodies being criticized was holding them back from joining in with things that they wanted to do. Um, that's certainly been borne out for me in a little bit of work we've done in primary schools. Um, I think Lucy and I were both really shocked uh, to sit with some uh, year six, so age sort of 10 um, children. And I'll remember a couple of the girls saying that they were really ashamed of their bodies and hated being PE and they didn't like their hairy legs. That's in year six. So what became very clear to me in 2016 was that this external messaging begins at a very young age. And it got me thinking about um, children's stories, traditional children's stories, so often full of princesses sought by handsome princes and the ones who are worthy of love, the princesses who are worthy of love tend to have long blonde hair, um, tiny waists. These are the people worthy of love. And I remember being told that the children's uh, movie, that Disney movie Frozen, was different because it challenged many of those traditional sort of princess type stereotypes because these were princesses, uh, Anna and Elsa, who were showing great strength of character. And I watched the film and I did love the fact that they are uh, women with strong characters. But you know, they also have waspish waists and long flowing hair and huge eyes. And there was a great industry in girls desiring to buy costumes um, and be like Anna and Elsa and buy dolls with tiny waists who looked just like them. 
So in 2016, I decided this was a real issue for two reasons I wanted to focus on this campaign. One is because of this message young people are absorbing, that their worth is all about their appearance. And the second is because we spend a lot of time, quite rightly, as a church, worrying about our lack of connection with young people. And I don't think we always start by engaging with the issues that are affecting and shaping their lives. That was from that soil that identity emerged. Now, it is important to say that um, issues of worth and appearance have been there probably from the beginning of time. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm sure that many of us can relate to all of this when we were growing up. If we're honest, probably many of us would say we still struggle with that issue of worth and appearance. But I know that when I was a teenager, I didn't have to contend with social media added into the mix. And so to whet your appetite for what we're talking about, we're going to try, and I hope it works, going to show you a very short film which comprises uh, young people in Gloucestershire sharing their own experiences about social media and about their appearance. And at the end of this, I'm going to ask you, uh, if you don't dislike chat too much, to simply to write one or two words in chat of your reactions. Social media has affected my confidence and the way I actually talk to people and my confidence in my daily life and how I'm being portrayed by others is more important than daily activities. It just makes me think how come they're like that and not. It makes me feel ashamed about my own body. And it puts you in that endless cycle of harm. It made me feel like I wasn't enough. When I wake up, I just look terrible, so looking at them makes me feel bad. It makes me feel quite upset about my appearance. It makes the, the off days a little bit harder. And that made me feel kind of like not good enough. And then when I look at myself, I feel like I'm fatter than everyone else and I don't really like the way I look and I get a lot of pressure from that. I started off maybe social media as like a joke but as it started to get more serious I started to be more self-conscious about what I posted and how I looked and everything. I wasn't being all I am now. I wasn't being the real me. The little things that are going wrong in your life maybe shouldn't be. It makes me feel jealous and insecure about my own life. So there's always that thought in the back of your mind of the like rating. Why, why do I not have as many likes as them? And then you begin to question yourself and you, you begin to question your self-worth and you try and make yourself better. When I see someone on social media, I always want to be like them. I want to look like them, but when I try, it doesn't quite come out. It got to the point where I judged myself and how I looked so much that I just felt like I wasn't good enough to even Around. But I feel like I have to make myself skinny and have these curves and not be as not have fat, like you know, and stop eating things that I really enjoy because I really want to look a certain way. I've got to reach a certain goal in how I look, and I'm aware that that's not a good feeling to have, and yet I can't help but think it. It can make you quite self-conscious about what you look like and how you are. Actually, I don't look like I'm supposed to. It can affect how my day is going to go. It can have such a damaging effect on mental health. It's not everybody's made that way. So uh, lots of words very similar, sad, angry, not surprised, upsetting, distressing, shocking. 
And these are young people from across our schools and colleges. And this is the repeated message. A lot of the teachers didn't think that these young people would be as open as that. And a lot of the teachers uh, were really shocked at what they heard and saw. So this is what's why I want to have this campaign. And what I just want to say for a moment is what I'm not trying to do. As a Christian, what I'm not trying to do when I speak with young people is squash their desire to enjoy fashion or hairstyles or jewelry. Um, I think the church has been guilty of that too much in the past. I want young people to understand good boundaries and good motivation. The way we dress or choose to appear should be saying something about who we are on the inside. The danger is when the outward appearance denotes our worth. How does it begin on the inside? You know, as followers of Christ, we are called to denounce idolatry, not to be conformed to the world. But this is not about fashion or appearance being wicked or immoral. It's about our starting place. It's about our hearts. And that for me is at the heart of this message. So I do tell young people that I enjoy thinking about what I'm going to wear. I do enjoy thinking about, well, what suits me and how do I want to express myself? But that's not where my worth comes from. It begins on the inside. In Romans chapter 12, Verses one and two, the Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So it is about not being transformed, not being conformed, sorry, to the world, but being transformed. And it is about thinking about our bodies in the right way. And interestingly, Paul then goes on in Romans 12 to talk about values and attitudes and behaviour. And all that begins with our hearts and minds. He also uses the image of the body. We're all very familiar with that, that image of the body of Christ. But I wonder if you've really stopped to think, isn't that amazing that Paul uses that image of the body of Christ as something good and then focuses us on our hearts? So picking up on what I said about there being no physical description of Jesus Christ uh, when he was on earth, I'm sure we would all want to say, that uh, Christ was pointing to God, and by God, I'm talking about three in one, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God revealing, and Christ revealing the kingdom of God. Christ was revealing in his words and actions and challenges, he was revealing the kingdom of God and constantly pointed to people's hearts and their motivations. So what I want to stress to young people is that who we are, who you are, your identity begins on the inside. And it's not about denouncing the body as something wrong or worldly. It's about getting it all in the right perspective. We are to celebrate that we are embodied beings. As Christians, we're called to see our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. We're to value and take care of our body. But the phrase that I use again and again is inside out. The phrase I love using with young people, inside out, not least because our world um, is messed up, um, is upside down. And as Christians, we like to use those phrases in a good way. We talk about the upside down kingdom of God. And I like to use that phrase inside out. And that wonderful psalm, which we're very familiar with, that we had this morning, Psalm 139, I was so excited when I discovered that in the message translation of the Bible, in Psalm 139, we get the translation that says, oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You shaped me first inside, then out. 
you formed me in my mother's womb. And again, I love using that version of Psalm 139 with young people. So summary so far, our worth does not come from what we look like, our bodies are to be celebrated, and yet recognising that who we are begins on the inside with our hearts and minds. And of course, as Christians, we'd have a lot to say about that as we talk about redemption and as we talk about confession, as we talk about our hearts and our minds. So before I come uh, to talk about the first significant component in identity, I just want to pause and I'm going to ask if it's possible to put us into breakout groups um, for about 10 to 12 minutes, groups of two or three, if that's possible. And I just want you to be really honest with one another and say, as we talk about this, does it resonate with your own story? This is about um, men, women, boys, girls. It's not just about girls. Does it resonate with your own story? And have you any thoughts about one thing that you could do differently, which could help us change the narrative, young people here, in order for us to be more kingdom shaped? So does it resonate with your story? Is there one thing you could do? There are no right or wrong answers here, just to get us thinking. Is there one thing you could do to help change the narrative um, that young people hear in our desire to be more kingdom shaped? Um, there's so much going on in the chat and we were having a conversation. Um, there's much we could pick up on social media and if we had longer, I would love to talk to you a bit more about social media. Someone said it's not just evil, um, we can use it uh, well. Um, and as someone else is talking about our identity as Christians, we would most definitely want to say our identity, someone just at the camera, our identity is in Christ and um, you know how we explore what that means. So one thing I want to talk about now for a little bit before we come to Q&A is relationship and our interdependence. We've talked a lot about appearance and worth and we can't talk about this without talking about relationship. At the very beginning of scripture in those early uh, creation narratives and those early uh, chapters of Genesis, we have those beautiful creation narratives speaking to us about who God is who we are, what the world is. And in Genesis chapter one, and in those first uh, four verses of chapter two, we have that repeated refrain, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. And of course the danger is that we assume that the goodness is in the picture. God just seeing what it all looked like on the surface. You know, we're told of the light and dark, the sky, the water, the birds, the animals, the seeds, the plants. And in our minds, I expect we will imagine the physical beauty of the appearance. In reality, there's not a lot of detailed description of appearance. Uh, in the second creation narrative in Genesis chapter two, uh, we do have that, those words in verse nine, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. But even then the description is quite limited. And what's really honed in on is the relationship between all the different parts of creation. There's a sense in God seeing, of God beholding it, of God affirming that it is good, what is being created, and the relationship between everything. And uh, the English translation of the creation narrative in Genesis chapter one tells of human beings made in the image of God. And we had that in our opening worship. Verse 26, chapter one, humans made in the image of God. There's no detailed visual description, but humans are created as embodied beings. And in the Septuagint, um, the early Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, that phrase used for image is icon, the icons of God. Because an image is not simply about external appearance. An image is an icon, is that thing created by an artist, a craftsman, to reflect something really profound about identity. And being made in the image of God is about having the potential to 
reflect who God is, that the heart of who God is, is relationship. We have it there in the Trinity. We have it there in the fact, the truth, that we are created to live in perfect relationship with God, with neighbour, with self, with the whole of creation. This is actually about love. So whilst I want young people to know that their worth, their lovability is not about their appearance, I also want them to know that this is not about individualism. And I think sometimes when you listen to adults who are trying to combat that, um, that lie that who you are is what you look like, we sometimes, I think, they're too much of the individualistic. People affirming that young child or young person for who they are, but failing to do it in the context of relationship. Because unless we submit ourselves to go on becoming who we've been created to be in relationship, in interdependence, then we still won't get this right. So again, that image of the body of Christ used by Paul in uh, Romans, as we've already commented on Romans chapter 12, and then in 1 Corinthians 12, it's a celebration of the body as the image, what it means for us to be unique individuals, precious individuals, and yet interdependent, all the parts of equal value. And so, a very key part of the identity sessions we've developed in schools and colleges has been to ask the young people, after we've talked about bodies and what they feel about themselves, to ask the young people who they aspire to be like. And although they'll quite often talk about celebrities and sports people and you know film stars, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they will tend to talk about the attributes when you push into why. It's not just about what they look like. And actually, if you really push them, who do you really want to be like when you're older? A lot of them, surprisingly, talk about their parents, their grandparents, friends, people they know, role models they have. And it's never about their physical appearance. It's about their attributes. And then once you've pointed that out, I get them to work in groups of twos, threes with people they know to talk about what they value in one another. And it's really quite moving. Quite often there are even a few tears or people well up as they hear their friends, often for the first time, talk about what they value in their attributes. As they talk about relationship and what it means to be in relationship with one another. So I'm going to show you two films. The first is one, um, they're, they're just snippets from a identity session, and it's at this kind of point, and even then they're edited. But um, the first one is of a girls secondary school, a grammar school, quite a middle class school. So you'll hear a very different kind of discussion than you might hear in some other places. Um, and this was a, a group of um, some younger girls to begin with, and then you'll see a focus of some sixth form girls. Which of you feels really happy with your bodies? None of you. I had one clearer skin. I just think that everyone's prettier than me. A lot of people who are famous are famous because of their looks. So it puts a lot of um, pressure on us to look good. I particularly don't want girls to be growing up thinking I can't do things or I can't be the person I want to be because I'm not pretty enough, or I'm not slim enough, or I'm not, all those kind of messages. And I think it's something we've got to work on together to give each other different messages. What do you most value in one another? She can just talk to people, new people, that she's not really that close with. And it's quite easy to talk to her. She always brings a smile to my face. We used to get into a lot of fights, and then like recently she's been really nice to me, and I feel like we've become closer. She's been like there for me through a lot of stuff I've gone through. When you heard what someone just said about you, how did that make you feel? Um, made you feel good? Yeah. yeah. You love your friends just the way they are. You don't really care how they look. And you're not afraid to say what you think. She wants to be a lawyer and she works really hard and she's a really good friend. She, like <laughs> gets me through the bad times. Yeah. I think you're really clever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> 
So what did it feel like hearing those things said about you? You're quite giggly. Yeah, you don't know how to react. I think yeah, because it doesn't social, happen. Yeah. <laughs> social media has like kind of almost it's prevented us from being able to express mm. our love for people person to person, face to face. Mm. Yeah. Because we can do it. Parents. Yeah, exactly. Because mm. you can do it online now, and because online it's all about what you look like. You never get to tell someone you're such a great friend and I love you so much. My happiness mm. every day would be on how do I look? Do, am I mm. acceptable? Like what? Mm. I don't know. It was very like what face value? What do I look like? I think that social media really sets the agenda and kind of dictates that appearance is the most important thing. And then you end up comparing yourself to everyone. They don't document the bad days. They document mm. the good days, and it makes you feel like That's really interesting. It makes you feel you like while well, their yeah. life is just amazing all around, there's nothing wrong yeah. with them. Oh, like so why am I, why am I not like this? <laughs> yeah. When you talk about body image, like it's not just like oh let's feel really nice about ourselves and like love us. It's not mm. like namby pamby stuff. Like it's really serious. <laughs> um, felt like I had to put up. Um, like present a life that was acceptable for yeah. my age range in mm -hmm. society. What we look like is how we're expressing who we are, but we're often not getting to that who yeah. are we. So it's yeah. being able to express the parts of yourself that you love yeah. without demotivating other people. Even some like body positivity models, like mm. they are saying it's okay to look like this, mm. but actually the people who I follow now on Instagram are saying it's okay to look like you. Yeah. Social media is a mm. part of our culture, so that does play a part, and I mm. think that's where the boundaries mm. cross a bit, is that does play a part in the fundamental nature of us. Mm. And I think mm. when it's like full on demonised by yeah. some adults yeah. sometimes, yeah. it's kind of quite dangerous because actually like younger children are like, no, it's important, and yeah. push back like almost too hard the other way. I feel like if young people are being role models, to other young people, hopefully something good can come. And none of you said anything about, oh, I really like you because you're so beautiful. <laughs> Beauty isn't, is it, about what we just look like. I want each of you to be the person you've been created to be. We're told that we're meant to look a certain way. Yeah. Like more likes if you're pretty, less likes if you're not. I don't want to fit in just to what the stereotype is for yeah. looking good on Instagram. I hate that. Comparing themselves to like Instagram models and like people like KD said, Kim Kardashian and yeah. things. But I think if you, you are different and that is so cool to be different. So what do boys feel? Do you talk about each other's appearances? Not really, we just made jokes. Yeah, it's like slightly just putting a little word in sometimes, it's not as open as with the girls. I feel like with boys, it, it is generally just banter, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a joke. Sometimes they do think you're actually, it's actually something nice about you, but maybe they're just too like insecure or like jealous or just like scared to come up to you and actually say it, so they just think it's better to be like mean to you. But how we challenge that, because sometimes we just go back, don't we, with a, another comment ourselves, rather than how do we actually say something we value in one another? And I wonder if in your conversations, as you were talking about what you really value, what you, the people that you really aspire to be like, probably isn't number one about what they look like. So I admire my mum. Your mum? Oh, tell me why. Yeah, because like, she's always happy and like, she doesn't really let anything get to her. I think my sister, yeah. because like, just like the way she dresses and stuff, like she just doesn't care what people think. I, like, I admire the old school rapper called Ice Cube. Okay. He was the first lyricist for the rap group NWA who and they pretty much created a major movement in America. He was the one who wanted to make the movement and also he was smart enough not to let money take over him. But who's willing to tell me something they value about someone else? Like she never makes like anyone feel embarrassed, like you could talk to her about anything. I'm never lonely because I can always go see him. He didn't actually want to talk about the person he admired, like he aspired to be earlier, but then when none of us said it because he was too embarrassed, he kind of stepped up and did it all to get for us. When you were well, with the lads, you never really hear, it's always, it's pretty much all just always banter, you never really hear anything like yeah. nice. Yeah, so it's something that banter, you don't just know what the truth is and people don't always want to tell you what they really value. It's a bit awkward because of the fact that when you look at yourself you always focus more on the bad things and when you get told the nice things it's a bit like... Brilliant. Actually we're all different and it's about how we become the person that we've been created mm. to be.
If you change the message amongst yourselves and start valuing one another and saying actually appearance is not everything and say what we value in one another, that will begin to ripple out. That's how messages get across the world, they get across social media. Again and again, we uh, just found that being um, people say they've never done that. They've never told their friends what they really think. And we've heard really moving things. People saying, you know, you're a really good friend. When I feel down, I can always come to you. Um, and, and that's really important. And I think actually in families and households, people hearing what they value of one another, uh, we're not always very good at saying that. And we tend to talk and talk, I think, about appearance more than we do our, our attributes. So I suppose the final thing I want to say so we can enter into a bit of conversation is that for me, this is kingdom work. Um, sometimes, not always, we get into conversations about why I want to do this, what I believe. I'm always very honest um, about being a Christian and why I'm doing it. Uh, but it's not, you know, that's not that the starting place is not necessarily a faith conversation. But if actually we believe that joining in with God's kingdom work is um, as uh, Colossians 1 verse 20 puts it, you know, that God's work is about re reconciling all things to God's self, then I believe that this work with young people is kingdom work. 